Well, yippee ki mofos. Welcome to my top 10 Bruce Willis movies video. So yesterday, I dropped my top 10 Jim Carrey movies. It was the top pick for my Patreon pick for this month. And it also, the timing just kind of coincided with Jim Carrey announcing his retirement. Also, just about a week before that, Bruce Willis also announced his retirement from acting for, for much sadder reasons where, you know, Jim Carrey was just mentally stepping away, felt like he had accomplished enough, wanted to do a, at least a break from Hollywood. Bruce Willis, unfortunately, has been dealing with this uh, th this cognitive issue called aphasia for a number of years, uh, presumably why he's been doing a lot of red box movies, smaller roles, quieter roles. And so he's stepping away from acting to focus on his illness, to spend time with family. And it, it, was, a, it was a heartbreaking thing for me to hear about. But top 10 Bruce Willis movies was another option for my Patreon picks. And this was right up there with Jim Carrey. So I wanted to do both. Now, if you're curious what Patreon picks are, Patreon is my crowdfunding source. That's a website where you can back creators financially and you get different perks, different things in exchange for that. Like I do exclusive Q and A's, exclusive live streams. I give them early access to videos that I finish early. I give away Blu-ray digital copy codes. And every single month I do a poll and they all pick a a topic for a video this month I'm doing two so if you want to back this channel if you enjoy this video I appreciate you considering that the link is down below in the video description and this is also going to be in collaboration with Sean Chandler who is doing the exact same thing with his patreon page and they picked both of these topics as well so his video link will be down if you want to check out his favorite Bruce Willis movies as well now as far as mine those of you guys that have been following me for a while, you know what's number one. I, I couldn't in good conscience just negate number one because it's obvious it has to be on the list. So I apologize for taking away the, the money shot, if you will, of this video because you know what it's going to be. But for everybody that might be finding me for the first time, Welcome, enjoy the ride. So number 10 for me is going to be a movie called The Last Boy Scout. It's one of the quieter you know, cult hits of Bruce Willis. It was directed by Tony Scott. It was written by Shane Black. And that writing, that screenplay is actually why this has made my top 10. It's a very fun script. I adore Shane Black's writing as well as his directing for the most part, didn't like the Predator. But The Last Boy Scout basically has Bruce Willis as this hard-edged cop, and he teams up with Damon Wayans, who is this retired football player, I believe. And uh, they go against, they go with each other to kind of solve this crime. It's like a buddy cop film where both of them aren't cops. And so you pretty much know the type of humor, the type of film you're in for at that point, but there's a lot of good action sequences, a lot of great comedy, a lot of really good, smart, hilarious writing by Shane Black. Uh, I mean, there's this whole sequence in the beginning where Bruce Willis walks in, to his house and he knows that his wife has somebody in the room and there's this whole hilarious and really tense sequence where he's about ready to blow a hole into the closet if she doesn't tell him then that whole character that bruce willis portrays in this movie is why i love it so much head or gut you touch me again i'll kill you and for those of you horror nuts that are watching this you also have a very young danielle harris in this movie and that makes anything better, doesn't it? Number nine is gonna be Live Free or Die Hard, also known as Die Hard 4.0. And uh, I'm only talking about the R-rated cut, the unrated cut, whatever you wanna call it. I don't even acknowledge the PG-13 cut. Although I will say, I still really enjoyed seeing that in theaters, so. Live Free or Die Hard is a sequel in this Die Hard franchise that I've never understood the amount of hate that it gets. I think it's a damn good sequel. I think it's extremely entertaining. I think that the writing for the character of John McClane is on par with the best of this franchise. I think it has some of the best action sequences of the franchise. There's certainly points where it goes way too over the top, like the last 15 minutes of the movie where he's jumping off of, you know, air carriers and stuff like that. Yeah, 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 okay, I get it, I get it. But, you know, it, it's something that I think that the movie kind of sets up that tone throughout, so I can still go on that ride. I like John McClane going against the digital age and going against these hackers. I like Timothy Oliphant as the villain. I think that Bruce Willis pairs very well with Justin Long in the movie. I think that the on-screen chemistry between those two is close to being as good as it was between Bruce Willis and Samuel Jackson in the third movie. So I love this movie. I always enjoy rewatching it. I will always sing its praises. Number eight is gonna be The Sixth Sense. Now this was the movie that put M. Night Shyamalan on the map. This was one of the more dramatic roles from Bruce Willis that uh, wasn't necessarily unexpected at that point, but certainly the level of success that this movie got was not something that Bruce Willis had seen the success of his dramatic stuff up to that point. So The Sixth Sense came out, it was a cultural phenomenon, the whole twist ending. This was a movie that 
came onto the scene and then just kind of changed movies for a while. It changed how we wanted to look at thrillers. And of course it gave us one of the most divisive directors of all time, a guy that just was on fire for like three movies there and then has just been up and down constantly ever since. So The Sixth Sense is a great horror thriller. It's a great mystery. It's a great character piece between Bruce Willis and very young Haley Joel Osment. And it's got some of the more intense, but not like graphic or horrific sequences that you've seen in a movie like this. And I still think that the twist works really well. You know, it's one of those things where you watch it and as soon as you see it, you're like, ah, how the hell did I figure that out? That was so obvious. But as you rewatch it, it always works for me. Number seven is gonna be Hostage. This is one of the lesser talked about Bruce Willis movies that I think is just fucking awesome. I mean, this is a good little thriller where you have Bruce Willis as this police negotiator that has retired from that position, taken this position as this small town sheriff because of this horrific event that he had as a negotiator. He just wants to have this quiet police life. And this really huge event happens in his little town to where you have these psychotic little delinquents that take over this house, that take these kids hostage, trying to get their father's money. And now Bruce Willis has to be thrust back into negotiator mode. Where the twist comes in is that the mob actually takes Bruce Willis's family hostage and tells him, if you don't get a, sp a specific item out of this house before the police raid it, then we're gonna murder your family. So now he has this moral conflict of how do I resolve this situation and save these innocent people that are being held hostage in this house while at the same time not doing my job the best that I can and not doing it the correct way because I have to get inside and get this item to save my family. And so it's this constant battle between his two goals. It's a really tense movie. It's got great performances, especially by Ben Foster, who is just off the rails in this. That's a guy that can go full psycho and just be great at it. Uh, even other actors like Jonathan Tucker, who I haven't seen too much from, I've never understood why. I've always thought he was great in Texas Chainsaw. He was even great when he showed up in Justified. So a very, very effective thriller that's got a lot of tension throughout. It's got some of the best performances from these actors. Even Bruce Willis is amazing in this movie. So for a quieter release, that I saw in theaters and have loved ever since. I just never hear anybody talk about this movie and it is fucking awesome. Number six is Looper. Now, I love time travel stories. When they're done right, they can be my favorite films of all time. And this was before Ryan Johnson just became associated with the guy that destroyed Star Wars. And I don't quite hold him completely accountable for that. I think that was just the studio and him just not coming to the same page on what the hell their trilogy was gonna be. But enough about The Last Jedi. Looper is truly an awesome sci-fi movie. You have Joseph Gordon-Levitt with some facial prosthetics to make him look more like a younger Bruce Willis, playing a younger Bruce Willis, and he's a looper. So he is an assassin that the this organization, this crime organization, sends people back in time for them to get shot in this field and the loopers get paid for that. And eventually their contract ends when their older self gets sent back and they kill themselves. So it closes out their loop. Well, when Joseph Gordon-Levitt's older self in Bruce Willis comes back, Bruce Willis kicks his ass and gets away. And so it becomes a movie where Bruce Willis is chasing Bruce Willis and the mob is chasing both of them. And so it's just a lot of high concepts, a lot of very creative concepts. The way that they visualize the time travel and like the, the time lapse and the, the way that the younger self can be damaged to show damage in the older self and to, in a wicked, disturbing scene at one point with Paul Dano. And really good action sequences here and there, really good grounded special effects and at the end of the day it tells a story about a mother and her son that is kind of embroiled in all of this by the end of it and so it's a very multi-layered movie that I think if you have not given Ryan Johnson's earlier work a chance because you didn't like The Last Jedi I think you need to get over it because he's got some great original films and Looper to me is the best that he's done. Number five is gonna be Sin City. Now this is a movie where on paper, especially when I was younger and I was very closed minded, this is a movie that I should not have enjoyed because I didn't really like comic booky, like like really visualized comic booky stuff or cartoonish stuff or anime stuff. And so this just looked out there. And on a whim, when this came out on home video, I rented it, I watched it, and I loved it. Sin City to me is still one of the best like comic book adaptations just because of how creatively and visually unique it is. Essentially, it's like three or four stories within this Sin City. It's like almost like a really fucked up version of Gotham. 
and you have different characters here that all kind of like Pulp Fiction are intertwined with each other in certain ways and it tells each of their stories out of order and in their own little chapters. And then you have Bruce Willis here as John Hardigan in one of the best chapters where he is trying to save this little girl from this creep, this mob boss's son, this mayor's son who is continuously brutalizing little girls. He saves her and basically all but kills this guy and they set the whole thing up to where John Hardigan takes the fall for all of that kid's crime. So he spends basically his life in prison until he finds out that this guy's alive and he's going to take revenge and go and get the girl that he saved. So he gets out of prison and goes and tries to right that wrong once again. And it's just a really good, intense story. I love the way that Bruce Willis is like classic Bruce Willis persona, persona comes out in this character to where he's kind of grizzled and you know oh, always talks like this, thanks for the advice. And it's almost like it's not quite John McClane because he's not as fun. He's not as vibrant as John McClane, but he's got the attitude of John McClane. It's like if John McClane was just hammered into a wall in prison for a decade. That's the version of the character that we get here. And so just for that storyline alone, I love this movie, but there's also a great Mickey Rourke storyline. There's a really good storyline regarding Clive Owen and just the way that it all wraps up and kind of comes back in together by the end of it, I think is great as well. So if you've never seen Sin City, despite the fact that we have gotten a plethora of comic book movies since this movie came out, this one still stands out as probably one of the more unique comic book movie experiences I've ever had. So definitely check it out. Number four is gonna be Die Hard with a Vengeance, a sequel that is almost as good as the original. It's literally within inches of the finish line. Unfortunately, the way they decide to end this movie kind of goes out on a whimper. I don't really like either version. There's also an alternate version you can check out where there's this whole standoff like in Moscow, and I don't even really like that ending so much. So this is a movie that changes up the Die Hard formula, sets John McClane in New York City for the only time in this franchise, and sets him off into this whole city to go and do these little puzzles, these little brain teasers, and try to disarm bombs across the city. So it's not this isolation movie where he's versus these terrorists. It's the terrorists kind of having him as like a puppet on a string. And you have him paired up with Zeus played by Samuel L. Jackson. Their chemistry is off the charts good. The writing and the bicker and the banter between these two characters is so damn good that it some people want to put this above the original and I have no argument whatsoever and mostly it's because of those two characters and how much fun they are on screen. Uh, I love Jeremy Irons as the villain here and the villain's ties to the original movie is great. It's a nice little surprise. Some awesome action sequences, a lot of brutality and, and bloody fist fights and gunfights, which just matches that tone of the first movie. John McTiernan came back to this franchise and delivered by far the best Die Hard sequel that we have ever got. Number three is going to be Unbreakable. Going back to some of the things that I said about Sin City, this is still one of the best and most unique comic book movie experiences that I've ever had, and it's not even based off an existing property. This is a movie that was just so far ahead of its time. This was a concept and kind of a, a switch on some of the expectations and some of the formula that you would expect for a comic book movie that would have played brilliantly maybe 10 years later, but it was way ahead of its time and it took forever to finally get the follow-ups to the story with this in Split and in Glass, which I love both of those as well. But Unbreakable, I prefer it to every other M. Night Shyamalan film. And I'm a big fan of a small handful of his movies. So this one is my favorite of his. I think that I, I like the tone and the darkness of it. I like the quiet mystery that is going on, whether or not Bruce Willis's character actually has superpowers or some kind of a godlike power or not. I love the way that it's all kind of told through the eyes of Samuel L. Jackson's character, who is somebody that believes this stuff to be true, but obviously nobody will believe him. This is a very grounded in reality version of a superhero origin story. I think that the whole journey that Bruce Willis goes on, on rediscovering some of the facts of his past and the fact that he's never been sick and he's never been hurt and he survived a car crash without a scratch on him, eventually it survives a train crash without a scratch on him and rises to the occasion of, holy shit, this is real, I'm actually a hero, I need to fit that role by the end of it all paired with that gut punch twist in the last reel of the movie. I just think it's an absolutely brilliant story. I think that it, it went unappreciated for so long, but I'm glad that 
enough people showed love for this that eventually Split succeeded and the ending of Split made everybody just cheer. The fact that we were finally getting a follow up to this story. And despite the fact that Glass was not for everybody, it was a very divisive film, I personally love the way that that movie wraps up. Whether it's bittersweet or not, I really appreciate the bold direction. So as a trilogy, the Unbreakable trilogy or the East Trail 7, whatever they call it, is awesome to me, but the best is easily Unbreakable. A teenage wedding and the old folks wished him well. Number two is Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction is one of, if not the best, Quentin Tarantino film. I think it's the popular answer for best. It would be my pick for number one, although there's certainly some close seconds. That guy's an amazing filmmaker. Pulp Fiction is the only movie on this list that I considered putting on here that's more of an ensemble to where, um, well, I guess alongside Sin City, where Bruce Willis isn't necessarily the star. But his piece of this story is just one of the more memorable parts where he's this boxer that takes money to take a fall in a fight, doesn't end up taking the fall, and then goes on the run from Marcellus Wallace, and then eventually meets Marcellus Wallace again in the middle of the street, and the adventure that they go on together is the stuff of nightmares. But as a whole, Pulp Fiction, I mean, what more can I say about this fucking movie? It's been hailed ever since, what, 1995 as one of the greatest movies ever made, one of the best independent movies ever made, and it still holds on to that belt. I mean, this is so many really wildly unique and creative and entertaining and so well-written stories that are all woven together and told out of order and some of the most memorable movie characters of all time, some of the most memorable Quentin Tarantino characters of all time, which is a tall order for the amount of wild people that he has put on screen. And for Bruce Willis to kind of, again, like Sixth Sense, take a bit of a left turn and do something that's not quite something you would expect from the Die Hard guy. Uh, he's somebody that comes into this movie and just plays it 100% serious as this guy Butch. And he still remains one of the more quotable sides of this movie. I always use that clip where he freaks out and breaks the TV whenever I'm talking about a movie that I hated or a show that I hated. So that's a gift all on its own. Just that little segment there. Motherfucking son of a bitch. But this is genuinely one of the best movies ever made. It's one of my favorite movies. And Bruce Willis is nothing short of a gigantic piece of why it is one of my favorites. But of course, number one is Die Hard. Again, for everybody that's been following me for more than a week, you probably knew that that was gonna be my number one. Sorry for blowing the surprise, but for everybody that's watched me for the first time, Die Hard is actually my favorite film of all time. I've done a number of rankings to where Die Hard has inevitably been number one, and we have another one now with top 10 Bruce Willis movies. I think Die Hard is one of the few movies out there you could say is genuinely perfect. There's nothing about it that I would change or alter in any way. I think that the writing, the humor is amazing. I love the character of John McClane. He's one of my favorite, if not my favorite movie characters of all time. I love the action in this. I love the fact that you get an 80s action hero who is this grounded in reality, regular guy. He's not this big, oiled up muscle dude that we kind of got used to with Schwarzenegger and Stallone in that era. He's against typecast in that era and then created like a whole new expectation for what an action hero can be. You got Alan Rickman here as Hans Gruber, one of the best villains of all time. In so many ways, this movie sets up tiny little things in the first act that are all paid off by the end regarding his character, regarding his wife's character, even things like the guy on the plane telling him to make fists with his toes to kind of release some of the tension from flying and that's why he doesn't have shoes, which eventually leads to him getting his feet cut in the third act and so many things that are just so intricately written and set up throughout this script to where it's so well handled and it's so interconnected in a way that is airtight that you don't typically see that approach to writing in a movie where it's supposed to impress you with all the explosions and gunfire. So Die Hard to me, decades later, still the best action movie of all time and still my number one favorite movie. So obviously it has to be my number one favorite Bruce Willis movie. So that's it guys, that is my top 10 Bruce Willis movies. Let me know your list down below. This guy has been in a ton of movies so there's gonna be a lot of movies on here that you love that I didn't even mention and vice versa. So I really wanna see everybody's list down below. If you wanna do a top five, that's fine, but let's talk about some Bruce Willis movies down below. Thank you guys for watching and please like and share this video if you enjoyed it. Go and check out yesterday's video, the top 10 Jim Carrey movies. That was also a lot of fun. Please 
hit that subscribe button if you enjoyed it because I continuously do these rankings. I've done director rankings. I've done quite a few of these actor rankings as well. So follow me along with the ride. This weekend, we're going to be talking about uh, Northman as well as this Nicolas Cage movie that looks crazy. And then about a week later, when Doctor Strange comes out, I'm going to be ranking all of Sam Raimi's films. So please join me in for the fun for that. Check out my Patreon page and Sean Chandler's video down below in the video description as well. Thank you for watching once more. And as always, guys, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean that you have to be.